Well, um, why are we so much talking about robotics and artificial intelligence today? Uh, because uh, these technologies are actually uh, becoming very mature and performant. And actually, what are they about? What, what do they do? They automate tasks. They automate things uh, that we are humans used to do. Yeah, I think uh, we're in a, an age where technology has more and more influence on our lives and where technology also more and more takes a more autonomous role. Where technology does things that previously human beings did. And um, the more that happens, I think it's important to, to think about what, what do we want to do, what do, do we want technology to do what could be potential problems like um, things with privacy, but also um, a question about responsibility, who is responsible when something goes wrong um, with an automated system. Um, uh, there, there are more questions also that, that have to do with social aspect. Um, of course, the question if, if jobs will be lost, uh, how many and, and what will happen, but um, also a question of, uh, of the meaning of uh, work and the meaning of our lives. I think, to, put it, to give you a short answer, I think the biggest challenge, I would say, the danger is to uh, simplify, oversimplify, to flatten what ethics mean. Ethics has to remain a question and the temptation, as soon as you move to law, but even more when you move to computer science, is to turn ethics into an answer. I don't have any problems to know if the machine can think if we do this question in terms of technical, the idea of simulation, etc. But in terms of general, it can think. I don't have any problems with that. I know that the machine can't think. It can think for many reasons. Because it's a vision of reductionist of the human being. It's to think that all the thoughts of the human being are in the brain, in the center of his body, in his history, in his context, etc. Tan, me parece que es una, una visión tan, tan chata que es imposible que, que, que se pueda producir ese efecto. Pero el efecto que estoy viendo contra ellos es verdad. Los seres humanos sí pueden pensar como robots. Y eso lo vemos todos los días. Y lo vemos cada vez más. So, uh, a lot of new technologies are controversial because uh, people are worried about them and concerned. And then the typical response by the technology developers is, oh, they don't understand the math, uh, they don't listen to us, why can't they believe our information, etc., etc. But the problem is that they're actually talking about two different things. The engineers are talking about the quantitative information, whereas the concerned public frequently is really concerned about ethical considerations. How do we design for it? So not just to, to point to the problems and say, oh yeah, this is very complicated, that's true. Not just point to the dangers, it's important to do so. Yeah? But also to think about design solutions and to, uh, to then build them and to test them and to think about the scaling. Yeah? So to not just think about, uh, okay, we have one human and one robot or maybe a few humans and a few robots or artificial intelligence systems, but actually to think about the systemic impact. In the, in the larger picture, I see all of this as a um, dark cloud over the future of democratic uh, society. It's not a necessary cloud. If you go to, let's say, Norway, Denmark, and so forth, they have intricate negotiations about work, social life, everyday well-being, and so forth, in which uh, people have a voice. They have something to say, and the outcomes look very much different, right? Uh, in the United States, the long-term um, tendencies uh, with respect to uh, technological change, you know, it's innovation. It's got to be good, you know. La robótica es mucho más, o muchas cosas diferentes que la inteligencia artificial. La inteligencia artificial puede estar aplicada en muchos más campos que no sea la robótica, pero la conjunción de esos dos mundos. Nos, es, es lo que nos 
configura los robots tal como los entendemos ahora mismo. De hecho, en los países donde hay una mayor densidad de robots eh, son los países que tienen eh, sus empresas mayor productividad y la calidad de los trabajos que ocupan los puestos, que ocupan los trabajadores, va mejorando con el tiempo. Con lo cual, eh, no hay que temer tanto eh, la implantación de las nuevas tecnologías, sino fijar las líneas en las que debe desarrollarse su aplicación. Um, we put very much emphasis on the ethical uh, side of implementing technology as well, because we feel that if you introduce new technology, you also have a responsibility towards the public to introduce it in the best possible way. Robots are things. There is no technical, no philosophical and no legal ground as of today to justify considering a machine, robots, as advanced as possible or AI system as anything more than one object. Porque no nos engañemos, la inteligencia artificial será colectiva o no será. Es decir, el futuro que nos espera es un futuro de dispositivos interconectados, cada uno de ellos con capacidades inteligentes. Si tenemos siempre en cuenta eh, las necesidades humanas de conexión social con otros seres humanos, pero también igual con la naturaleza, con otros animales no humanos, y eso lo intentamos implementar en, en las criaturas y entidades artificiales que vayamos a construir, pues crearemos una sociedad más armónica, más inclusiva, ¿no? en la que también tengan cabida pues, estos, eh, estos seres de silicio. En tecnociencia no tenemos ese miedo escéptico. Empezamos en el medio de las cosas, sabemos que manipulamos cosas, sabemos que somos físicos, we are ourselves physical, we are in material interaction with the world, so we don't have that problem of how to bring things together, mind and world, right? That's not our problem. Our problem is to actually just make things work, arrange things, compose things in such a way that they work together and produce certain effects. And this is also a way of knowing the world, of learning about the world. La pregunta del millón es que es un robot y no nos vamos a poner de acuerdo. Si, 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 si te pones en la, en la mesa a dos personas que, que, que hagan robótica, acabarán con tres definiciones diferentes de robot, uh, porque no estamos, nos, nos, hay varias definiciones de varios organismos y ninguna de ellas satisface a, a la comunidad. Por tanto, es un poco difícil. Eh, el público en general, además, mmm, Uh, utiliza robot de inteligencia artificial de un modo bastante indiferente y muchos de los miedos que tiene la gente, muchas de las preguntas que tiene la gente, de hecho cuando yo voy a dar charlas divulgativas, la mayoría de preguntas no son sobre, sobre robótica, son sobre inteligencia artificial. El robot es un sistema bastante complejo, porque el robot pues tiene una eh, parte importantísima que lo diferencia de otras cosas que no son robots, como por ejemplo una mera inteligencia artificial, y es que tiene un chasis, tiene un cuerpo. ¿Vale? Entonces eh, hay algo mecánico que le permite moverse y, y realizar acciones que son tangibles, que son palpables. ¿eh? No es un pensamiento que se queda en una nube y que, o es un código que resuelve un problema y, y ya, ¿no? sino que hay una acción, hay una acción física que se ve. ¿no? Y este es el, esta es la definición propia de robot, es este mecanismo que yo toco, que, que, que hace una acción que, cuyo resultado también se toca de alguna forma ¿no? y que luego por supuesto está dotado de una inteligencia concreta, ¿no? que lo hace autónomo. Esa es otra parte importantísima de la definición, si no hablaríamos de un mero autómata que repite la acción y nada más. ¿no? Entonces el robot requiere de su chasis y de su inteligencia. ¿no? As I define it, a robot is similar to a living being which also perceives acts in the environment. The difference is that the robot is built by humans, programmed, whereas it's directly or through learning by humans to help them. It's not something that has its own uh, objectives as, as we do, as human beings do, or animals. So it's a machine, a machine which is 
uh, physical, not software. Physical machine which interacts with its environment and acts in its environment. And of course, the action is key to define a robot, the physical action. Uh, to act in its environment, uh, it needs to perceive it, to build representations of this environment. And these representations will enable it to make interpretation to, uh, about the environment to decide for its actions. So, action, perception, decision. Of course, it needs sensors to supervise the environment for the navigation, but also if it's about grasping things, about manipulation, it needs a more complex view of the environment. It needs some 3D information, not only to see in the picture where the object is, but to know where it is located in space, how to move the arm to get there. I think this is all um, yeah, things that we as humans learn quite easily when we are a child. Um, but of course, this is all abilities that we have to teach to the robots. Uh, to achieve these capacities, it uh, is better that it, if it were able to learn, because otherwise it will be fully pre-programmed and cannot really be uh, very uh, efficient or uh, its performance will be limited uh, to what it has been programmed for explicitly. So learning enables to improve those capacities, the capacity of decision, capacity of action, and the capacity of interpretation as well. When we talk about the robot, uh, in the imaginary of the world, there is that type of robot. And that type of robot needs two things. The principal thing would be more robotic, which would be the physical, the sensors, the actors, how I decide to move, those types of things. And the intelligence artificial, which is how the robot gets aware of what is happening, how it decides which of the different options is the best, cómo detecta situaciones de peligro, cómo afronta esas situaciones de peligro, cómo encuentra una situación para la que, la que nadie lo ha, lo ha preparado, ¿no? una, lo que le llamamos las situaciones imprevistas. ¿no? Nadie programó al robot para actuar en ese momento, pero el robot visto una situación es capaz de hacer algo, y hacer algo hacia el buen camino. A lo mejor no es lo mejor, no es la mejor opción que se podría hacer, pero va hacia el camino correcto. Esa generalización del conocimiento es inteligencia artificial. La interacción entre un robot y una persona es muy difícil de modelizar, ¿vale? Y entonces ahí es donde la inteligencia artificial em empieza a tener sentido. Eh, cuando voy a ser yo como humano, como matemático, como científico, incapaz de plasmar una cosa en ecuaciones que puedo ejecutar en un programa, entonces la inteligencia artificial me permite meter un modelo que yo pueda utilizar para controlar el robot. Uh, the way it interacts with people could be different, but basically it has to understand what we are asking it to do. And, and this means we have to provide to the robot the ability, the capacity to interpret language, speech, gestures, because we speak with our hands, as I'm doing now. Un robot social no te va a poder interactuar jamás con un ser humano si no es capaz de reconocer o interpretar las expresiones faciales de la emoción o eh, afectos o emociones expresadas no solo por la, por la proxemia, la distancia entre dos cuerpos objetos, o objetos o la conducta no verbal. Eso significa que en el momento que a un brazo normal, por ejemplo, de, de industria de toda la vida, conservadora, por decirlo así, que está enjaulado porque es peligroso para las personas, cuando le dice de hacer un movimiento, el brazo se va moviendo y si en el mientras pasa una persona o hay un objeto o hay cualquier cosa, el robot intentará de conseguir llegar a esta posición hasta que, hasta que no lo apagues. Pues entonces, por esto hay estos tipos de, de, digamos así, de, de colisiones. Sintiendo la fuerza en el momento que toca cualquier tipo de objeto, el robot siente que se está aplicando una fuerza externa y puede, por ejemplo, el primer no sé si comportamiento es de bloquear el movimiento y no no sé si empeorar un tipo de, de, de colisión que puede haber, sobre todo con personas. Al final, lo que queremos es robots seguros, ¿no? Queremos robots que sean... Eh, que perciban su cuerpo de una manera segura y que sean capaces de predecir que, en este caso, eh, en vez de ser agencia, será predicción, qué acciones van a hacer en el entorno, ¿no? Eh, y es muy importante que no dejemos a los robots como agentes reactivos solo, sino dotarles de la parte reactiva pero también de una parte de predicción de qué efecto pueden hacer cuando interactúan con una persona. 
eso va a dar tanto seguridad como mejorar la interacción con, con la persona que tiene enfrente o con cualquier otro entorno. The, the issues are about complexity, diversity of the environment and of the tasks that the system is able to achieve. If you have little diversity, little complexity, it's easy to automate the, the tasks. If, if you have large complexity, uh, uh, diversity of situations, uncertainties, actually we don't know how to do it. El mundo de la inteligencia artificial se ha singularizado en diferentes capacidades de los humanos. La capacidad de razonar, la capacidad de aprender, por ejemplo, ¿no? la capacidad de interpretar lo que los sensores nos están dando. ¿no? Hay, por lo tanto, muchas capacidades en nuestras inteligencias y esto ha derivado dentro del área de la inteligencia artificial en áreas específicas, en nichos donde los investigadores han intentado reproducir en máquinas esas mismas capacidades. No imitarlas, no hacerlas de la, manera, de la misma manera, sino resolver los problemas a los que se enfrentan los humanos con esas capacidades. En los años 2005, tener un robot móvil que se moviera era la bomba, era mucho de mecánica, mucho de mecánica, mucho de motores, mucho de baja de, de, de electrónica, era la ente mecatrónica. La robótica era fabricar una ente mecatrónica que funcionara. A día de hoy, esto ya está, ¿vale? Hay mucha gente que son capaces de hacerlo, barato, caro, chino, americano, japonés, español, es quien sea, eso existe. Ahora, el robot es el software del robot, que es la diferencia. Es globalmente el software y luego para aplicaciones industriales como hacemos nosotros, es mucho el proceso, lo que está haciendo, que lo haga bien, ¿vale? Y entonces, en todo esto, pues hay técnicas de de robótica de toda la vida, pero también ahora mucho de inteligencia artificial, que sería más bien de cómo voy a ayudar al robot a hacerse un modelo de la realidad cuando es difícil de modelizar. Uh, now we are achieving a, a new phase of automation because of AI systems and their ability to make uh, predictions from data. So, this is the era of data. Uh, data is produced in, in, uh, in uh, unimaginable uh, quantities every second. It's stored, it's on the internet, it's available. So, you can use statistical based systems to try to identify patterns in those data to try to uh, build a prediction from past events, because you have a lot of data on past events. This is what AI is doing. Y ahora estamos en otro boom, ¿no? El boom de los, del deep learning, eh, el analizar con, con high performance computing, con ordenadores de altas prestaciones, que, tiene la, que tenemos ahora a nuestro alcance grandes cantidades de, de datos, y gracias a, a, a algo que se le va a ir. Internet, ¿no? Y se desarrollan los algoritmos, bueno, se desarrollan, se readaptan o se mejoran los algoritmos que existían desde hace más de 20 años y ahora antes no, no daban resultados espectaculares porque faltaban datos y ahora funcionan muy bien y, y ahí estamos. Los algoritmos de Deep Learning para ciertas cosas perceptivas y pues funcionan muy bien, la verdad, porque se pueden entrenar con muchísimos datos y obtener una asociación rápidamente. Pero hay que ligarlo a sistemas de razonamiento más simbólico para poder esto explicar eh, por qué toma determinadas decisiones o incluso ir un poco más allá ¿no? de encadenar distintos mm, procedimientos para conseguir un, una tarea más eh, complicada. ¿no? It's about... Uh, trying to classify a lot of parameters and this uh, requires to optimize their values and you don't know why this specific set of values provided such results. So it's the black box. So because of all this, uh, 
The idea is that if you want to deploy those systems, if you want to accept to use them, we should be able to trust them. Bueno, sí, lo ha clasificado, pero es incapaz de decir por qué. No es capaz de construir un, un story, un storytelling, una historia que permita que un humano entienda el por qué este patrón es tal cosa. De modo que estos algoritmos que funcionan ahora, que son cajas negras y que a los unos inputs sacan los outputs, pero no podemos mirar por qué, en este paradigma no sirven demasiado. Para la visión general pueden servir para cosas muy particulares. Pero en general necesitamos que los robots sepan explicar por qué toman decisiones. Science might use technology, but its goal is representation. Now, techno science uses representations, uses scientific theories, and so forth as tools. Techno science is not so much interested in theory development, in creating true representations and descriptions. Techno science is not very interested in making sure that things are understandable to the human mind. So, what are cognitive robots? There's many different definitions, but cognition means uh, the ability to think and to reason and to learn. Um, so, that, so that's an essential element of these, uh, uh, of these robots. So uh, you could say traditional robots, they've been around for decades building our cars and they do so in nice closed off uh, environments. And so we call this closed systems. It means we can understand and control and actually we make sure that the whole world passes by these robots in a completely predictable way. But we don't live in a world like that. Humans don't live in a world like that. It's unpredictable, it's chaotic, it's complex. Uh, and that means if we want to bring robots out of the confined labs where humans should not be, <laughs> we put fences around it, uh, and uh, we bring these robots out into the real world, where humans use them, misuse them, interact with them, uh, are scared of them, uh, play around with them, etc., etc. That's complex behavior. And then all of a sudden, the human element comes really close. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's the moment when you start, you need to start to think not just about the sensors and the cognition, and, uh, but you should also think about, uh, you know, actually this dynamic equilibrium. Las personas trabajamos con el error, no trabajamos con la incertidumbre, mientras que los robots ahora mismo lo que se obliga es que sean precisos, exactos. Entonces necesitamos robots que para interactuar con personas sean capaz, capaces de trabajar con ese error. Error en el cuerpo, error en lo que ocurre, error en los modelos, todo eso es lo que tenemos que solucionar. It's very situated, very bound to uh, specific settings, and then you have to really concentrate on the setting. You can't say, okay, what is an interactive robot? It really depends on where you want to situate it, where you want to build it up. Porque al final eh, un robot o un dispositivo por muy avanzado y muy cooperativo y muy colaborativo que sea, si el usuario no lo percibe como una ayuda y como una posible tecnología que va a mejorar su nivel de vida, pues no lo va a aceptar, ¿no? Va, va a recibirlo como una carga más incluso, ¿no? otro trasto más que tiene que aprender a manejarlo. Tactile technology means that uh, I want uh, to replicate the presence of something. For example, here I am touching uh, an object, a book in this case. If you remove the book and you put some technology on my finger, like this one that we are developing, that pushes my finger as soon as I get close to the same height, I feel tactile. La agencia es la sensación de control de que uno es el dueño de una acción, ¿no? y eh, la agencia se puede ver alterada en, en situaciones patológicas y, eh, y es algo que es, es muy interesante porque podemos en realidad virtual podemos eh, disociar digamos la ejecución de un movimiento con eh, podemos disociar cuando alguien hace una acción pero su cuerpo virtual puede hacer otra ¿no? esto nos da un marco experimental en el que podemos ver eh, cuáles son las bases de, de esta agencia, ¿no? La agencia es un, es un concepto que se utiliza en psicología, por ejemplo, que te permite ser capaz de reconocer tu efecto en el mundo. Los robots no tienen esa capacidad, pero los humanos sí. La, el, el concepto de responsabilidad 
de que tú eres responsable de una acción en el mundo está basado en eso y eso está basado en el cuerpo también porque tú aprendes qué efectos produces por la relación entre tus acciones y el efecto que producen en el entorno. Uh, so uh, using the understanding of how we use our body and, and how we use forces to, to control movements, how we could use that as a link to make robots and humans uh, really, really interact and not uh, just throw control back and forth. Por supuesto, con la evolución de las prótesis, con el control más natural de, de su movimiento y con la inclusión de, de, de sensores que permitan también aumentar, eh, en las, mejorar las sensaciones de, de tacto, etc., pues eh, se mejorará mucho la incorporación y se pueden llegar a sentir como parte del propio cuerpo. La gran diferencia que tienen los exoesqueletos con respecto a otro tipo de robots es que te los puedes vestir, ¿no? Es un, es un material, es un dispositivo que tú te vistes, lo, lo anclas a tu cuerpo, de manera que puedas suplir o, o no suplir, a veces suple, pero otras veces incorpora o adiciona eh, energía, ¿no? Porque la necesites, por ejemplo, personas que tienen problemas para movilidad. Hay un concepto muy relevante que es el de la asistencia, la asistencia personal, pero también la asistencia a través material o a través de máquinas, ¿no? porque en muchos casos hay derechos que ciertas personas no pueden satisfacer o no pueden ejercer sin el apoyo, ¿eh? sin el apoyo de alguien o de algo. ¿no? So there were a whole bunch of uh, 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 changes that were required in that way, which made society more uh, inclusive. Uh, the term in Spanish is uh, diversidad funcional, right? Uh, and uh, the, the, the idea is that a um, good society, a just society, should um, serve the needs of its people including changing material structures and software, hardware, in ways that um, are inclusive. El mundo que nos rodea, el entorno, está hecho al humano. Por tanto, es decir, a que tenemos dos piernas y dos brazos. La accesibilidad de todo lo que nos rodea está pensada o pues, se, se, se ha adaptado a nuestro cuerpo. Entonces muchas veces es más fácil crear un humanoide porque ya el entorno no tenemos que tocar. El entorno está ahí, ¿no? A lo mejor eh, muchas veces hacer otro tipo de morfologías implica que tienes que, que también cambiar el entorno. La autopercepción es algo que lo hemos sabido, pero, pero la mayor parte de gente no sabía ni cómo explicarlo, ni, que, ni si es un sentido o no, o, que, o cómo funciona la integración corporal en el cerebro, uh, con cierto detalle, ¿no? o el, el papel de las emociones en todos estos procesos. Um, so, I argue that the emotions of the public are actually important uh, signals that something at val of value is at stake, and that for that reason we should actually take these emotions seriously and start the deliberation about ethical aspects of technology from there. ¿Qué es la emoción? La emoción es un, un sistema neuroquímico uh, que sirve para dar sentido y etiquetar sucesos. También es, es un tipo de disposición estructural del cuerpo hacia ciertas relaciones con el mundo. Uh, no sé, me explico. Es decir, uh, que algo sea dañino depende de mi estructura. Nada es dañino o positivo eh, simplemente por su estructura interna. ¿Sí? ontológica, no sé, este, este, este sifón es bueno o es malo, bueno, depende, hay, hay seres que si beben de esto se van a morir, hay seres que si beben de esto en ciertas condiciones les va a ir bien. Entonces, las emociones lo que crees es una estructura de apertura hacia el mundo para interactuar. Cynthia Brizel en el MIT ya tenía a Leonardo y el Kismet, que ya hacían interacciones muy básicas, muy, si yo estoy enfadado, yo hago cara de triste, el otro pone cara de triste como si tuviera empatía. No tiene empatía. Esto es una de las cosas que se juega mucho a nivel ingenieril, hacer ver que tengo un robot que siente. Los robots, los robots no sienten nada ahora. Es que no lo sabes. No, no, sentir es un proceso químico mucho más complejo. Um, now, however, these machines can simulate much of that. So machines can Uh, pretend to be intelligent, pretend to have feelings, emotions, and even pretend to develop an emotional attachment to human beings. On the other hand, humans are very prone to humanizing objects they interact with on a daily basis. Now, they don't have probably 
like morality or they don't have um, uh, self-awareness, but they do have behavior. They act, and that that acting can be um, surprising or or uncomfortable or maybe just right sometimes, but maybe not just right uh, at other times. And that's just talking about one human, one robot. Yeah? Um, and so the impact of these kind of technologies on society, um, well, that's, that's uh, kind of mind-boggling to think about it as. Our jobs of the future, whatever they're called, will involve doing lots of the most human tasks because that's what the software robots can't do. Los robots van a dar trabajo porque van a permitir, por un lado, a crear nuevos puestos de trabajo que todavía ni imaginamos. Porque van a habrá necesidad de gente que mantiene, construye, programa, pinta, viste los robots. Y habrá necesidad de gente en otras tareas que se permitirán gracias a que robots nos liberarán de muchas tareas que ahora estamos obligados a hacer. So, uh, from a personal perspective, we see a lot of um, um, opportunities for robots in, for example, the agriculture or the healthcare sector, but only if the robots are implemented in a, um, let's say, people encompassing way it, it's it, it's not our goal to replace people with robots um, and that's why in the lab we also have a great emphasis on uh, cobot work where the robot and the, the person can jointly work on for example assembling things and if you look in industry uh, we see that these kinds of technologies that come available those are one of the reasons that companies do not offshore but are able to keep production here. So um, uh, it also contributes to the sort of economic landscape that you have in a country if you're able to implement new smart industry technologies because that's not, not only the case for robots of course, it's, it's the smart industry as a whole. When you think about what should people be learning now the answer is, don't do things that AI can, which means emphasize the most human skills, soft skills. I know that people are crazy about STEMs, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, and that's fine, but actually a lot of those things are exactly the types of services that can either be provided by super smart people in Russia, the Ukraine, and Pakistan, or programmed into, into AI software. So that's, uh, you know, the, if you're going to be innovative and you're going to be at the cutting edge, there's going to be all the room in the world for you. But at the low end, I think a lot of those jobs will be automated. But the soft skills like meetings and being human and being emphatic, being ethical, being curious, uh, dealing with unknown situations, those sorts of skills won't be replaced and they'll be more highly valued. Uh, and also, things that require face-to-face, -face. so being good at meetings and talking to people, motivating people, reading people, whether forming trust with people, those sorts of skills are the ones that I think will go forward. Desde luego abogamos por un enfoque, como dice la OIT, centrado en el trabajador, en el trabajo como cualidad eh, útil para la vida de las personas, eh, no, no las personas robotizadas para trabajar mejor, sino eh, las personas capacitadas y formadas para poder ocupar esos nichos de trabajo, porque trabajo no se va a instruir según nuestros estudios eh, de forma tan alarmista o tecnopesimista como se ha dicho hasta ahora, va a cambiar la naturaleza del trabajo disponible y el reto fundamental es si estamos preparados para ocupar esos puestos de trabajo. When you manufacture something, you can do it with your arms, with your hands, but you usually, mostly, invent machines so that it's done more efficiently, uh, faster, uh, maybe in a more uh, accurate, precise manner. 
we automate. We want to uh, produce better, we automate a process which is completely repeatable. And um, we have been automated for, automating for a long time. The term medio, an activity, a post of work of a person, Típicamente podía tener fácilmente entre 10 y 15 tareas distintas dentro. Algunas de ellas pueden ser más modelizables, más automatizables y otras no tanto. Yo creo que por teniendo en cuenta eso, donde habría que poner, enfocar el tema es en el, el equipo persona máquina. Of course, challenging our economy is, is both positive and negative because it's, automation is a way to produce more wealth, to uh, improve uh, the uh, capacity of society to produce um, goods and wealth and, and of course normally to share better this wealth and those goods. Uh, so it's positive but at the same time it's negative because we have this challenge of um, dealing with uh, loss of uh, meaning, loss of our uh, um, position in, in society because we are defined by our uh, jobs, we are defined by, by our competence, and this is challenged. Um, so this is why we are talking so much about this. Now, you, the question is about ethics. So let's think of the case of a, an autonomous driving vehicles. Now, all these subjects could be responsible for some parts in the uh, call, final causation of the accident, pinpointing which one among them is the sole or primary responsible might be very complex and very demanding, both from a legal and also, let's say, economical point of view. Y el robot ha de ser capaz de darle una explicación de ello, que no sea una mera asociación de decir a porque por estadística me ha salido esto, ¿no? sino que eh, le pueda decir no, he hecho esto porque pasó lo otro o porque en una interacción anterior me dijiste que querías ir más deprisa o más despacio. O... Quiero decir que es muy importante ahora también todo el tema de lo que llaman la explicabilidad dentro de inteligencia artificial, porque como más relación hay con las personas, más necesario es hablar en sus propios términos. So our view on the ethics of technology is not uh, let the engineers do the work and then we come in as very critical philosophers say this is all bad and should have been done very differently. Rather, we really see the wonderful con contributions that technologies make to our well-being, to the world. But we also see um, the possible risks and downsides of technologies. And our idea is that if we detect them at an early stage and reflect about them uh, and really engaging in ethical thinking from the start, then we can address some of these um, ethical problems that might arise and redesign technologies so that they really are developed for the better rather than for the worse. How do you make sure that they remain in tune with who we are and who we are about to be in the future. That's tricky. And there are clever answers here. Yeah, some computer scientists have come up with these inverse reinforcement learning models. But even those clever answers have problems um, because they rely on a fairly reductive understanding of um, what it is to have an ethical preference. It's very difficult to say, okay, we build guidelines, we build ethical guidelines, and then the engineers uh, simply implement it. It's, quite difficult. So you have to find micro features of interactions that kind of um, represent the broader principles such as responsible innovation. Y aquí yo creo que es muy importante la labor de impulso que están haciendo las instituciones de la Unión Europea y en este sentido la comisión impulsando proyectos en toda Europa para que eh, los investigadores reflexionemos acerca de cómo de manera transversal encontrar eh, las normas mínimas necesarias para regular eh, los avances tecnológicos en beneficio de la sociedad de los europeos y de todos los que con nosotros se eh, relacionan o interactúan. Well, law is partly that. Law, we do need answers for all sorts of areas in our life where we can't keep asking our questions all the time. We need like some official answer. Yeah? So law does stabilize 
answers to the ethical question. But even then, we're supposed to keep questioning the answers provided by law. So while it's already difficult for us to keep questioning law, it's even more difficult for us to question computer systems which have inbuilt ethical choices. I think if we can bring together um, uh, technical computer science and um, philosophy and social sciences, uh, we have a better chance of, of understanding what's going on and, and to build better technology that is also there for, for human beings and uh, that respects also the, the values that, um, that we have. Uh, among our values are, for example, privacy. Our private life uh, is something we value. We value also our security. So when you have a system that is uh, obliterating, in a way, your um, privacy, your uh, own, f finally, uh, intimacy, your life, and, and make it making it uh, actually exploited to guide you th towards some, some decisions. I'm speaking about, for example, uh, targeted uh, advertisements, etc. I very much support the direction of trying to uh, keep our European values and not say like we go in the authoritarian direction like China and also not in the totally laissez-faire direction um, of, of the US. So I think it's, it's good to um, to find there our European um, style of regulation and um, and develop a vision for, for this. Um, so I think this expert group can contribute to that, but in the end it is also something that um, should be subject to public discussion. Unless you think hard about how we humans change our views about what's right and what's wrong, then you can't design systems to help us make decisions um, in a way that is that remains faithful to the fact that we might change, that we're constantly evolving. So this is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we face today when we design, say, decision support systems meant for morally loaded context, is how do you make them uh, in tune? But I know that in many European countries still, uh, care is taken care of by women in the family, within the family and sometimes without any... Um, they are not employed. They do this because it's part of their duty and their tradition. And um, uh, and it's also... Uh, one problem with this is that it's genderized. This is a female sector, the care, while engineering and, and technology is often male-dominated. So these two worlds meet here. And that's also something that can be very innovative, but I think that's the reason why home care is still, um, still have a low status. Many things that's going on there is under the radar. It's very necessary the presence of both women and women in all facets of this life, in all the areas of professional areas. Because, as I've said, they are complementary perspectives and that makes the global result global be much more heterogeneous and positive and good. Yo he dado charlas en primaria porque es cuando eh, pues, las niñas todavía no tienen esta influencia cultural de que pues, las ingenierías y no son para ellas y como en general a estas edades también están más evolucionadas que los niños, pues la experiencia es súper buena. They understand that uh, before, I mean, most technologies were developed in la laboratories. And you know this image of the engineer, the male engineer walking around in a white coat? <laughs> that doesn't exist anymore. But uh, 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 today, many engineers understand that that's not enough. You need to understand how technology works in a con social context. We are going to meet uh, robots uh, in hospitals, in, uh, in different environments. And uh, for this reason, it's important to train people to understand, to be aware of uh, what robots are, how they can interact with them. And uh, for this, uh, the, the educational system plays uh, a very important uh, role. Um, 
These other applications we already tested in some elderly care homes and we also got very good acceptance from the staff. Um, if they understand that it's not about care, robot, care robots in the sense that they really take over the care uh, tasks with the residents, but they're more like a, a working aid for the, for the staff to support them in their work, to make their work more easy, um, um, to help them focus on the things that really have meaning for them. Um, so I think this also kind of goes into the area of non-technical challenges um, and, and um, how to deal with them. Um, of course, acceptance is, is a big issue there, um, but from our um, experience, if the people who are supposed to work with the robots understand that these robots are designed to make life easier for them and not to replace them, which I think is an illusion because we already have uh, not enough care stuff anyway, so it's really all about making the working life easier, um, help, helping to, to reduce tasks that are not really care tasks, um, supporting them on one side um, on a timely uh, matter, but also support them with some physical tasks to, for example, make it easier to lift a person from a bed. Sometimes old people say no thank you to new things or to innovations. And I think that we misunderstand that very often and think that they are a bit afraid or insecure or that they they just don't want to be part of the future but I think that we misunderstand this what they what happens is when you are, become very old you often become more pragmatic because you have had you have many experiences and when you're old you have to economize with your time and your uh, energy detrás tiene que haber un montón de trabajo para que algo sea más intuitivo de lo que es actualmente la tecnología porque lo que primero provoca un cualquier dispositivo es un rechazo por parte del usuario. Porque lo veo muy complejo o porque lo veo amenazante. Si no sabe muy bien de lo que consta, se sospecha que hay algo oculto. Entonces, toda esa parte no técnica, cada, para mí cada vez va a tener más importancia. I think that is necessary to to teach robotics from the very first uh, uh, stages of education and in that stages it's interesting also because robots are, are not only a, a subject of study but also an, ob uh, an object of study so we can, uh, we, uh, can uh, teach robots but we can also teach with robots. So robots can be a, a tool for explaining, for example, physics, mathematics, uh, coding, uh, uh, and, and so on. I want to train lawyers in my law faculty to be able to work with computer scientists much better. I think at the moment law schools are not doing a good job at producing lawyers who can be not just aware of data issues, but also can critically engage with you know, computer scientists and understand what the challenges are. And I think it's a big issue and lawyers at the moment have not really caught up with the fact that these systems are changing the way in which we practice law already. So I think there are many uh, kind of nexuses or in interfaces between societal questions and, and questions about technology. Um, and um, I, I would like that um, yeah, more people thinking about technology also connect to political philosophy, for example, um, and and also environmental philosophy, because I think questions about the environment for me are also always at the same time questions about uh, how to use technology, uh, how to relate to the world with technology, um, what kind of technologies do we need, um, what kind of solutions to technologies provide, but. Could there maybe also a problem with the very idea that, that always technology is a solution? Who has, or who ought to have, or who rightfully does have, a legitimate voice in making choices about our technological and social future, right? That was the big question, right? Um, so STS in that context was not just academic work to produce new theories, new concepts, new frameworks, and so forth. STS in that setting was uh, 
a kind of uh, possibility for uh, democratic uh, participation, a new um, uh, dimension in modern democracy in which people would say, yes, we see these technologies have the, the possibility of changing a lot of what society is composed of and how it works. So let's study that, reflect, and using the processes of participation, democracy, voting, uh, research, and so forth, try to make intelligent um, public choices. We think about how um, uh, the kind of technologies we develop and the choices we make for the human-robot interaction, how that actually uh, might, you know, change social dynamics. Um, then all of a sudden we talk about sociology <laughs> and maybe anthropology, and um, and we need to to cross boundaries and disciplines uh, if we want to solve this. La robótica, como, como buena cosa y también como mala cosa, es que es una ciencia muy interdisciplinar y, y necesitamos de mecánicos, de electrónicos, de programadores de bajo nivel, de programadores de alto nivel. De, ahora después pues, en los equipos empieza a haber psicólogos, filósofos para la ética. Empieza a hacer, a hacer grupos matemáticos, empezamos a hacer grupos que son muy multidisciplinares. I think that sociologists and social scientists should be more brave, not only describe things and make a distance and don't don't be so afraid because you can collaborate and still be critical you don't have to buy into everything you can still be critical geologists and philosophers need to familiarize themselves with the logics of the technical scientists and the engineers by i mean but they should not confuse the one into the other into kind of, okay, now I'm an engineer and I try to think like an engineer and I now build a machine which is social, it doesn't work because, I mean, you have to be both, I think. La formación es absolutamente técnica y especializada y yo creo que en el mundo en que estamos cada vez más es importante tener una visión más amplia, más humanista. Cuando vas a la esencia de, de cómo funciona un ser que percibe el mundo, pues esto es la filosofía. Y entonces los ingenieros, si solo hacen robots, no saben qué hacer con el robot ni qué tienen que hacer. Entonces, cómo se diseña, cómo se orienta, aquí es el lugar donde los filósofos, como parte de, del colectivo de cognitivistas, tienen un papel posible como psicólogos, como los antropólogos. Y así tenemos que mirar en el legal sistema, tenemos que mirar en las complejas ética consideraciones y también en la evolución muy desarrollada de la tecnología para resolver todos estos problemas. Y este es otro ejemplo donde a multidisciplinary approach is the only viable approach. La multidisciplinaridad yo, yo creo que no son barreras, son oportunidades. Yo lo vivo como una oportunidad de, de, de conocer cosas nuevas y de ver diferentes puntos de vista sobre, sobre las mismas cosas. Por lo tanto, hay, hay toda una transferencia de conocimiento. Como decíamos antes, pues desde la, los circuitos electrónicos a las redes neuronales o desde la lógica a los sistemas de representación del conocimiento en la inteligencia artificial, yo pienso que hay toda un, un tras, una transferencia de conocimientos de uh, ciencias sociales fundamentales para entender estas sociedades de uh, sistemas inteligentes. Y ahí es donde hay mucho trabajo, yo creo que tenemos que hacer. You have to acquire and develop a common language because very often the same term might be used with very different meanings. So when a, a, an engineer talks about uh, autonomy, he primarily entails automation. And when a philosopher talks about autonomy, it's actually a very different meaning that also has to do with a freedom of self-determination. When a lawyer talks about autonomy and the ability to enter into a contract, that might also mean something completely different because even a legal entity that is not a physical person might validly enter into a contract. And saying that that legal entity is a legal person does not entail recognizing that as a living thing. So if a lawyer, engineer and a philosopher that do not have any understanding of each other's field uh, speak together, there might be a huge misunderstanding and the conclusions that you draw might be absolutely and radically wrong. 
about the, this uh, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary collaborations are important and takes time, it takes a lot of time. And um, unfortunately, funders, um, research funding organizations, they don't always understand that it takes time. But it goes forward one step at a time. <laughs>